So hello, everyone. My name is Dalbert Wetter, and I'm a member and board of directors of Respectability, a nonprofit organization fighting stigma and advance opportunities so people with disabilities can fully participate in aspects of community. I will start by describing my appearance and we'll ask each of the participants to do the same. So my hair is gray, slightly peppered with glasses. I'm wearing a brown shirt. And we have live captions as well. You'll be able to see at the bottom of your screen, a CC button. That's so that you can see uh, the captions and that link is available in a separate link on the chat. I also wanted to thank Hulu and Respectability for making this event possible uh, by supporting this platform for deaf professionals from the entertainment industry to share our experiences, our knowledge from working in film and television industry. Today, we will talk about a show that has earned a lot of critical accolades lately. The show is called Only Murders in This Building, which you can stream on Hulu. Now, one of the greatest things about this show is how it approaches disability inclusion and representation. They wrote a deaf character, that character an authentic deaf actor to play the role. And in a recent show, they showcased this character and ASL dialogue in almost the entire silent episode. Wow. Respectability always encourages creators to think more broadly on how disabled actors can play any role, whether the character is written with a disability or not. In a recent show, they cast Tony Award winner, Ali Stoker, uh, who's a wheelchair. Uh, user to perform in a guest role with her disability, which has nothing to do with the story or the plot. That's wonderful. I also wanted to mention briefly that a central theme of this show is the podcast industry and its massive population. I would like to share some facts uh, that some of you may not be aware of. There are over 2 million podcast shows there are over 84 million podcast episodes. I mean, that's a lot. Over 68 million people listen to podcasts every month. That is a lot of content, full of information and knowledge. But most of them are not accessible to deaf and hard of hearing people. So if you enjoy podcasts or creating podcasts, I encourage you to ask podcast creators to add transcriptions to the podcast so that deaf and uh, hard of hearing people can enjoy and learn from them too. To start off, I will introduce a film producer partner, Jevin Wetter, who also happens to be my older brother. Jevin is a graduate from the American Film Institute, F AFI, where he earned his MFA in production. He also earned an MA in theater of arts from San Diego State University. Now, he is a filmmaker and professional of ASL and deaf theater at CSUN, at CSUN. Jevin wrote a film uh, screenplay for Flash Before the Bang, which earned honors from Film Independence Producers Guild of America, SFFILM, and the Writers Guild of America. So, so now, to you, Jevin. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here with you. We have two amazing guests with us, uh, and we'll have this opportunity today to be with them. The first one is James Calvary. Um, his nickname is apparently Joey. This is his name sign. And the second guest that we have is Douglas Ridloff. And his name sign is here on side of the face. Now, I want to give you a little bit of their bios. Uh, and so, you know, uh, first of all, what I look like. So I've got blonde hair, some white showing now, I suppose. 
I have a navy blue polo shirt that is buttoned and I'm wearing glasses. So now let me introduce James to you or Joey <laughs> Calvary. So he is a well known for playing Theo Dimas in Only Murders in the Building which is the most watched uh, comedy series on Hulu. He also made an appearance in Chicago Med uh, that was on season four. And a Bennett song holiday. Now he is an award-winning stage actor having toured with the National Theater for the Deaf for many years. And he also had the opportunity to work on Broadway and many regional theaters as well. Just not as an actor, but also a writer, director, producer for stage. Now, our second guest, Douglas, has worked as a consultant at ASL uh, for also for films and television and A Quiet Place is one of them, uh, Quiet Place 1 and 2. He also worked with Marvel's uh, The Eternals, which is the newest movie that's going to be coming out soon. Uh, he's also had the opportunity to work on Saturday Night Live, on Hawkeye, which is a TV series uh, under Marvel. And also, only murders in this building. He is a poet, a visual storyteller, creating original works in American Sign Language. And he's been featured on NBC News, Circa, HBO, Vice, and CNN. I'd like to welcome both of them to our stage. Hello. Hello, hello. Now, before we go on, could you please describe yourselves what you're wearing for our uh, audience who, um, who may not be able to see you? Hi, I'm Joey. I'm wearing a button down gray shirt. I'm a white male with a beard, a very low beard. And uh, my hair is uh, in a form of slicked back style. And gosh, I've been incredibly busy uh, background. I've got a bookshelf with tons of books. Uh, and I am Douglas. I'm a white bald male with a black beard with a white goatee. I have on a white button, uh, excuse me, a blue button down shirt with a fireplace in my background. Uh, that is uh, a form of white. You know, I always think that in the fireside chat, I think, you know, what is it that we should bring to a fire chat? What is it? Of course, we bring our marshmallows. Does everybody have their marshmallows? Everybody have theirs? Let me get my marshmallows. Okay. You've got Delish. your sugar ready to go. Your Hershey's bar. And what are we forgetting? And your crackers. Fire. <laughs> nice. fire. Nice. So I'm really excited to be able to um, have these two people of murders, only murders in this building, uh, which is a podcast, as I mentioned, which is very interesting to have this conversation. So we know that deaf people typically don't use podcasts. Uh, it's a hearing thing, right? They're able to hear the podcast. So we're learning more about podcasts through this show. So have either one of you experienced podcasts before? Never? No. This is Doug speaking. So one person reached out to me about doing a podcast with me. And I said, hey, look, okay, that's fine. But you know, I'm deaf, right? And so they were like, I know, I know, but I really love your work, your poetry. And I'd, I'd like to, to bring that into this podcast. And so they began asking me, uh, how we could do it and how we could make it accessible. And so we did have some talks. We brought in an interpreter to uh, voice from ASL to English and be my voice uh, in the podcast. However, 
it, what ended up happening was that we needed to add transcripts to also include with the podcast. So it will be released, I'm happy to say, in January or February of next year. And so hopefully this is a groundbreaking thing in the world of podcasts. This is Jevin. So Joey, uh, do you have any added podcasts? Something you mentioned, uh, podcasts. Joey here. No, I've never been in a podcast myself. I have heard there are more podcasts out there and they're becoming more accessible for deaf and hard of, uh, hard of hearing people that with transcripts provided. So they're making additional features available, which I think is great. I think NPR is doing that for their podcasts already. So I think that's really a nice feature. Yeah, it used to be my parents who are deaf. You know, of course, there was no radio back in the past. That was a hearing thing. So there was no access to radio. So hopefully in the future, podcasts will have transcripts. That'd be great. Thank you. Now, I'd like to focus this conversation to productions. As we all know, film production has three phases. We have the pre-production, followed by the production, the filming, and then the post-production. Um, so I want to focus on these respective aspects and get you to talk about each one of these separately. I'm sure there are a lot of people who don't know much about how to produce a film. So uh, I think we'd like to start with Joey. What is your experience? How is it you get your roles and how did all this come up for you? I'd really like to know your process. Sure, Joey here. Uh, my agent sent me information about the show Only Murders in the Building and they told me about who the producer was and I heard Steve Martin was when I found out Steve Martin was involved I thought that would be a wonderful great I I took the audition I got a call back it was all handled through zoom so that was really a first experience for me to audition using zoom mm -hmm. but I think the whole experience went well and a few weeks later I was cast I got the role congratulations this is Jevin congratulations now Douglas how is it that you got involved in this production uh, as the ASL consultant? Uh, did you get this uh, opportunity prior to Joey joining the production team or afterwards? Curious. During the time of Joey's audition, John Hoffman, who is the creator and producer of Only Murders in the Building, reached out to me and said, hey, look, we need an ASL consultant because we have one episode that has heavy usage of American Sign Language. And there were two or three uh, potential actors cast for the role. And one of them was Joey. And I mean, without a doubt, there was a very close resemblance to Nathan Lane. And I was like, you've got to pick him. It's got to be him. So I, I knew Joey before this production and uh, he's just a beautiful person. And so when I connected with Joey, after that, we decided to work together and the script was sent to me to read through and um, break down and translate for two actors, the first being Nathan Lane and the second being Liv, who is the Olivia yes, yes. Uh, Zoe yes and so I was in the role of translating the lines for the two of them and we hadn't met until right before the start of shooting and uh, so we had worked prior to that so I'm curious as ASL consultants people would imagine that you know it seems that hearing producers would think that an ASL consultant would be for the hearing actors. But what is your perspective on that? Is it also for deaf actors or hearing and deaf people? Either one of you can answer. Joey, go ahead. Oh, no, Joey's saying you go first, Doug. Oh, all right. I will speak. I will speak. I think it is imperative to have an ASL consultant like Doug. I think that the assessment of culture that is brought with the language, the time period, the regional signs that might be needed, I think that 
ASL consultant is imperative for that. When I first sat down with Doug and we spoke, we, I asked him if there were any specific New York City signs I should know about because I had just moved to New York in the recent past and I really wasn't familiar with what might be a regional sign in New York. You know, that New York City accent, what would that look like in sign language? And so Doug was able to give me the, that kind of information. So it's so valuable to have an ASL advisor like Doug working with me as an actor. So everybody in the cast, whether they're deaf or hearing benefits. Absolutely. I, I agree with you, Joey. If the entire production is uh, made up of hearing individuals, there's a definite need for a consultant who is deaf, not a hearing ASL consultant, but more specifically a deaf consultant or advisor involved with the production to work with the deaf characters, uh, just like Joey and many others, and for uh, hearing members of the production as well. Now for a deaf character with a, a New York accent and lines that are maybe not able to be easily understood for face value. My role is to help translate that line and, and understand the meaning behind the line. And for some actors, for some deaf actors, sometimes they're easily able to pick up on that. And sometimes um, it does require some expansion and translating. And so for some actors who have to learn signs, then there's definitely a need for an ASL consultant to be involved and to help translate the line and understand their language of uh, their level of language proficiency. And so with, with Zoe and, and Joe, um, Joey's character interacting with each other on set, talking a little bit more about how they will interact and okay, so when did this character learn sign language and, and how they're able to communicate with each other and that, that feeling of, of getting the sense of fluency and maybe they're, this person grew up uh, using oral uh, language as their primary language. And so there are varying levels of fluency in American Sign Language. And so I think that's really important to, to uh, be involved, to have an AS ASL consultant be involved and work with the director and uh, talk about deaf culture tendencies and what's different and what angry signs look like or what quiet signs mean or bold signing uh, or very intimate signing. And so really being able to advocate and support and provide that cultural information in a safe space is, is vital. And so that's the role of an ASL consultant. This is Jevin. I couldn't agree with you more. I think there are a lot of hearing people who realize that just by speaking, you know, there are intonations in sp uh, spoken voices, there's inflection, there's pitch, uh, you know, how fast or how slow a person may speak. But people may think that sign languages are just monotone, you know, that they only exist on one level. Um, so it's very important. And now that I think about it, People know that ASL, you know, we have consultants. Uh, we also have ASL dialogue coaches. So what would be the difference? What would be the purpose of having one or the other? Why is it necessary to have a, a coach and a consultant uh, or a dialect person? What, what would be the difference? Joey, I, I think you might uh, be able to offer some perspective. Joey here. There are a lot of names associated with what that ASL person might do, right? Consultant, coach, a lot of that has to do with the amount of work that the individual might have to put into the translation. For example, if an actor already knows American Sign Language, if they already know it, that's a different requirement. The consultant may be just looking and giving some advice. Uh, and compared to another actor who is cast, who knows absolutely no American Sign Language, has no understanding of deaf culture, well, then that person's responsibilities have just increased. And so I've seen uh, the director of artistic sign language used as another 
name for what that person does. And that person brings all of the resources and their knowledge of culture, of regional accents, as I mentioned, of the time period of sign of, uh, that the play is placed in. So with these different names for the position, I think comes the different responsibilities that are required. Douglas, did you want to add? Absolutely. This is Doug. So I've worked uh, in several productions with different titles, and I got to the point uh, after a couple of productions where, where the levels are. Sometimes there's an ASL dialect coach. They focus specifically on translating lines, and that's all. And they look for signing errors and approach the actor with corrections and or fixes. For example, if the person uh, is, is not knowledgeable uh, with how to sign in a particular language uh, to show a, a particular version of signed language, they can talk about how to make the signs authentic and, and look more authentic if that person is not a native user. And so uh, it's not, they're not involved with pre or post. And that's an ASL dialect coach. The ASL consultant is part of pre, during, and post production. And during post production, uh, well, especially during COVID time, they would send me information to send back to them and get my continued uh, advice and, and consulting about captioning. Sometimes there are bad takes, and there are other takes that uh, work with the script supervisor and we've already worked on those during production and so we 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 work with those and then with pre-production sometimes there's involvement with the casting process and uh, informing the casting director that uh, this person has enough skill level uh, to to basically pick up sign language and so there's that that uh, knowledge that the role brings with, with consulting. Um, so that's the main difference between the two. Now for a Dazzle, otherwise known as a Director of Artistic Sign Language, I feel that relates more to stage uh, performances. That's just my perspective on that. Joey here. I think the concept of an ASL consultant or coach is a relatively new idea. And I want to say that perhaps the idea of having an ASL consultant for stage or television or film, I, I, I think we didn't have those 10 or 15 years ago. So I think the deaf community has recognized the value of that position. And we are finding more and more ways to include that. And we are defining what those titles responsibilities might be. And so we are trying to pinpoint ourselves what is the best title and to be used for a position like that. I know that in the earlier conversation, we talked about consultant and ASL coaches, that your job was very significant and it depended on a lot of collaboration uh, from the director uh, to be open and be willing to listen. Um, just to have somebody in there, but it may not always work. The director may not be open to that feedback. Did you ever have any experience working with any director who was either very open to the ideals or very resistant to them? Would you mind sharing those experiences if you can? Joey here, I've experienced both of those uh, in two different productions. I've experienced a production where I was the ASL consultant for a television show. And unfortunately, I would have to say the director was very resistant or was guarded with the idea of collaborating with me. And I understand it. This was her project, her baby. She wanted full control. I, I completely understood that. But to include a deaf character on the screen and not have the full understanding of ASL or deaf culture, especially if the 
character has a relationship with other characters. It takes time uh, to develop that. So I was very fortunate with this production, Only Murders in the Building, because I had a wonderful director and wonderful writers, John Hoffman and Sherian Davis was the director for that episode. They took a lot of time before we ever started rolling to sit down and have discussions with me. And I could share all of my concerns about the script, about the dialogue, about character choices, we could really have some open, transparent discussion of perspectives on the character of Theo. And I felt very included as an actor. It's hard sometimes as an actor to speak up because you, are in, you do feel intimidated. And sometimes as the only deaf character in a cast, it's very hard to make sure that that representation is authentic if everybody else in the room is not a good collaborator. It can become much harder for us to do our jobs well. So in this production, Only Murders in the Building, it was a terrific experience. Oh, my cat is over here. Sorry. <laughs> my cat is making an appearance. I'm throwing you should, you should give the cat a mar our marshmallow. Yes. <laughs> yes, let's do that. Anyway. We had a wonderful team. So they all, to everyone took the time to sit together and make sure it could, all the changes would be made for the best to make the story effective in the best possible way for my character. This is Jevin. Now I'd like to move on to a particular point uh, in translation here that may be hearing actors who work in English will read the dialogue and just produce it in spoken English exactly as it's written down. But what people may not realize is that deaf actors are expected to then translate that English into American Sign Language. And so to be able to do that is a different process because it's a different grammar, it's a different production. Of course, American Sign Language and English are different languages. So what is your perspective in that process? Do you think it's easier for actors if they're open or, or do you believe that you know, it requires a lot of help. And who would be that person who would help? Or are there those that you experience who feel they don't need that help? So I'll start with Douglas and then I'll go to Joey. This is Doug speaking. Every script is different, but I want to talk about specifically with only murders in the building. There's a lot of humor, sarcasm, uh, and there's a lot of humor and sarcasm involved. And, and in working the translations in comparison to other productions I've worked on, there were several lines where Joey and I met and we really had to break down the language and what the meaning was behind the line and, and, and how to sign one of the lines between uh, that Zoe had, uh, pity me, pity you. And so how to translate that line, but still follow the intention of the line that's in the script and being able to deliver that in American Sign Language and have it still be applicable. And so we, and, and get to a place where we both feel good about it. I think uh, sometimes there's attempts to be funny and it's, it's missed. Like, I hate those fucking people. Uh, Oh, Joey's saying yes, I remember that. Yes, and working with uh, the, the, doorman. the doorman. Right, it was the doorman. Right. Uh, he signed, I cheese those people or something. And I think there was an attempt to have humor where, where the ASL mimics how we would have humor in English. And it really just missed the mark big time. And so I, I reached out to uh, the producers and, and suggested uh, different options. And so they were able to make those changes and to get it close enough to match the humor. And so that's really, really important for uh, me as an ASL consultant to break down that language. And Joey, uh, as an actor, many deaf actors um, run the gamut in terms of being able to um, read and write the script and produce this beautiful American sign language, but don't have a strong background in English. And so they do need a little bit more support with the script and, and, and understandably so if it's not their first language, 
uh, written English and, and ASL is their first language, uh, it, it only makes sense. But I know that English follows hearing norms. And so it's it can sometimes be a struggle for deaf actors. Uh, right. So it just depends on their level of English proficiency. And it really is individual to the actor and their ability to understand what's been what's being presented and uh, and what what needs to be translated. Joey, you wanted to add. Joey here, yes. I always make a point of people that I work with telling them that ASL and English are two completely different languages. And each one has its own structure and grammar. There are some ASL expressions that are really hard to put into English. And there are some hard English expressions that are hard to put into ASL. In translation, sometimes some things are lost. And fortunately, with our writer, John Hoffman, he was willing to change any line Absolutely. that wasn't, wasn't being uh, easy to translate into ASL. He was so responsive to us and we were, I was so grateful for that. I think it's important that writers that who are writing scripts and want to have a deaf character, I love the idea that they're writing that, but they have to understand that it's complete, ASL is a completely different language and they might write something in English that they think is really a clever, beautiful metaphor, but is really hard to then translate into American Sign Language. So I really want to say it's so important to have that understanding that writers need to have that experience. Jevin is saying, yeah, sometimes they're having that addition, you know, you have to have a cold reading, which you have to give the script and tell the person on the spot, they expect you to just learn it right now and be ready to just go in and audition, which, you know, cold reads, people don't realize that that puts but you could say double pressure on an actor, right? Especially on a deaf actor. So as a talent, there needs to be the opportunity to have time. So I wanna ask how much time do you feel is important to give an actor to be able to prepare on those translations? Um, some people might think that 30 minutes would be appropriate. Some people might think an hour or a day or two. What do you guys think? Joey here, I think at least a day at the minimum, if you get the material and you need to have that plenty of time to understand what it is, to talk with your peers, to understand any English to ASL translations that might be necessary before you can go ahead and really get ready to rehearse. This is Doug. I would say it depends on each actor some actors need more than a day. And I, I welcome that. Uh, if there's, you know, a, a partner I have or a really good friend that I could quickly uh, share the lines with and get feedback on, it, it, it just depends. It, it depends on the actor's level of access to people who can help. <clears throat> I would say uh, sometimes I've been given 12 hours to work through the lines. And so I would say it really just depends on the individual. Joey here. I think that perhaps more professional actors might need less time. Right, possibly. right. <laughs> Jevin here, well, could you imagine Shakespeare? I mean, I would imagine that would take a lot more time because we have old English. We have to figure that out into layman terms for today's time and then go into ASL. So that's triple the work right there. Yes, um, Joey says, Google your best friend. Right, right. So now you have to come up with, you know, new signs because we have new young actors coming about, young deaf actors. So have you had to work with actors who are young deaf actors who are just getting into the business? Joey saying yes. Do they need more help or do you think they were able to do the work on their own? I would say a new actor and also depending on age. I've worked with very young talent and it happens that 
They may not be fluent in American Sign Language. Maybe they use signed exact English. And so maybe they need a little bit more time and attention to work through the lines. And so I, I present to them ASL and they give me their signed exact English. And so then I can mirror it with that actor. And then we find a, a common ground to meet in the middle where it becomes ASL. And so those types of actors may need some support in that area. Now, if there's another actor who is working for the very first time, they are completely green to this uh, process and script translations, but they, they are in film or television or and, and they're making eye contact and there's high emotions, <clears throat> all of the elements that create this intersection of the character on screen. There's a lot of elements that I can provide to support all of those different elements to make it work. And so uh, with this type of actor, more support would be needed. This is Jevin. I think we've had a lot of conversation about the pre-production, but now let's actually turn to the production of the filming. You know, now with COVID especially, how is it that you guys were able to do that work that requires such proficiency? I know that for deaf actors, oftentimes they'll need interpreters on set. So let's talk about that. How, how that's actually part of the filming. You know, now we've prepared, we've got the signs going. Uh, uh, Joey, would you like to address this? Yes, I've had an interpreter on the set with me. And of course, it takes a little bit of education to give the cast and crew how to work with the interpreter, how to interact with me using the interpreter. And I would say after the first week of that, the crew and the cast having the deer and a headlights look, you know, they don't know what to do. Everybody quickly finds the comfort a comfortable way with it. And I can take on that role of an educator at time for the first few days when I'm called to set in teaching everybody how we use the interpreter. And then once the shooting uh, starts, my interpreter will find a place to hide behind furniture or step away from the room during the actual take or if the or stands behind the camera in sight line so that they can, you know, the cameraman will give me the cue if the interpreter is out of the way. So in my work experience with interpreters, that's that's what I've encountered. Douglas? This is Doug, I'd like to add that there shouldn't be many different roles uh, that the actor has. The actor is there to act and it's really not the talent's responsibility to educate. Uh, when, when hearing talent comes into the room, there's no education aspect of their job. They, they continue to work to be better and better and better at their craft. And so my role is I'm, I'm not a helper. We, we, we make them get an ASL consultant. We make them get or hire a deaf producer or, or hire folks to be involved with the production to pave the way for deaf talent and to and actors to show their skills and focus on that craft alone. I think the industry really, really needs to have a couple, maybe, you know, one or two in the production to make sure that this experience is successful, it runs smoothly, and that the actor is comfortable with uh, focusing on the job at hand. I think this is a really, really vital piece of information. In my previous um, experiences with uh, Hulu, and this is the interpreter, I missed the other production, is it Hawkeye? Um, yes. The, thank you. So one's, one's based in Atlanta, and there's a lot of COVID testing every three days. And then we need to be wearing our, our uh, face masks at all times and participating with the directors and script supervisor through the monitors and, 
and having a lot of communication that a lot of running back and forth with things that need to improve. Now with Hulu for only murders in the building, uh, I worked from home. And so that was, um, that was. You worked from home? Yes, I worked from home. And that was an issue because Joey was there on set alone and I wasn't able to be there in person. So they did give me a monitor uh, that I was able to participate live while um, they were shooting. And I was able to call the interpreter to, uh, to FaceTime with the interpreter to then communicate information to uh, talent. And so, you know, it was, it was a task, but it did work out beautifully. And I think the system worked and uh, it was great to have the interpreters involved and, and so uh, having skilled interpreters involved. And so uh, if it wasn't a great team, this, this isn't possible. It's just utter chaos. And so it's really important to also have a good team. Uh, that's a vital part of it as well. Joey here. And it's great that Nathan Lane did his homework as well. Yes. Oh, I caned him and I caned him until he got the language. This is John. Hey, you know, it's important, you know, just only murders in this building, you know, to have those directors, obviously, you need to make sure that everyone's in agreement and that there's cooperation, that you're on the same page. You know, in television, you typically can have a variety of directors. So you need to make sure that everyone is in agreement. Joey here, I was involved with four episodes, two, uh, I, I had two different uh, directors in one, I was in the second episode and the third episode, that was a different director. And so each time it is a re-education for the director. And I would have to say, that's the cross that we carry. That's the right. I will carry that cross for the rest of my professional life. We will always, I, we just have to. I see you, Doug, I know. But I hope it doesn't happen in the future. We've, we've got to beat down the doors and let them know that, that, look, hey, actors have power to change the dynamics of this. ASL consultants, don't have that power like the actors do. Kevin's agreeing. And I, I've, I've seen it and I'm trying to, to tell you that every actor I've worked with has the power. They hire you, they see your talent and you let them know if you wanna see my talent blossom, then I need these deaf people involved with the production behind the scenes to help me blossom. Amen. I'll say amen to that, Joey says. This is Jevin. Uh, for the best practices, we need to raise the bar. We want there to be inclusivity, you know, so that jobs are given to deaf directors, deaf writers, deaf productions, uh, producers, so that there is that investment instead of just bringing in, uh, you know, the deaf person in the show and then just giving that. We need to make sure that we're part of this. So hopefully in the future, uh, we'll be able to have that. Now, for the sake of time, I'd like to get to issues of editing. Many people realize that you need to work in production uh, collaboration when you write and develop the show, certainly while you're filming and producing the show, but people forget about the editing room. So where is it? Do, do you have a collaborative effort there as well? Oftentimes, editors are just one or two people in a room making those decisions. Um, but when we're talking about a shot, being able to look at two different shots, two different perspectives that may cut off a sign or sign right in the middle of their dialogue. Um, so do you have any influence or challenges in the editing room? Joey says, this is exactly where an ASL consultant should be involved in every aspect of a production from start to finish, from pre-production through the actual filming to the post-production, all three phases, to make sure that there is authenticity on that screen and to make sure that signing on the screen looks right. And I'd like to add, this is Doug, that 
in the first production, they didn't really ask for post or pre. They only asked for translations only. However, they did ask for uh, the trailer and support with the trailer. To make sh to make sure that the ASL was approved, but for the movie, there there was no involvement with that <clears throat> because I was the ASL dialect coach. Then part two, they did ask me to approve the reading and 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 all of that. And so in my other two productions after that, I think the problem starts. In the beginning, I get the script. And then during production, the storyline changes, the vision changes. And so there's some tweaks that happen to match the vision. And so what's important is getting the angles and the shots and uh, approaching the folks behind the camera to talk about what works for a close up. Sometimes if it's too close, then the sign language gets cut off or uh, sometimes some of the signs are cut off, but you can the audience can still make out the signs. And so I want to ensure that all of the sign languages is, is captured. And so then in post-production, I can explain that everything looks good, everything looks great, and then let the script supervisor know, and they make their marks in terms of which is the best take and which is the worst one. And so when that's done, they deliver that to the post-production editor, and that's another new story. It's, an, it's another new story. So it's, it's like the game of telephone. It's changed hands so many times, and there's a lot of misunderstandings that happen. And so then when, when I finally watch, there's some misalignment with what was previously communicated. And so I think there are many possible situations that can come up during the editing process and many that I don't, I'm sure I'm not even aware of. Um, but in terms of giving feedback, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll see the same thing happen again and then I'll give feedback on the same issues. And sometimes it's really hard to, to capture some of the signs. And then it's like, oh gosh, as, in, as an ASL consultant, this work makes me look like I didn't do my job proficiently enough. And so it reflects on me. And, and so what, uh, you know, at the final product, it's like, it is what it is. This is, this is what we have. And so I think it's really important, just like uh, Jevin mentioned, we need to raise the bar and we need to use deaf talent and we need to use a lot of ASL dialogue and have that as a part of pre, during, and post-production <clears throat> in terms of, of just full involvement to allow for the full support of the actor's work and also support the director and support the entire production team and the editing process. And, and so uh, as, I, as it goes back to my initial point that the ASL consultant really doesn't have that much power. And so uh, actors like Joey are able to step in and, and speak up and, and, and choose which battles to fight or, or um, you know, maybe, maybe if I pick too many battles to fight, then maybe uh, Hollywood will decide, you know what, it's too much work to deal with these deaf actors. You know, if, if, if this is, and so it, provi it, it gives the wrong uh, idea about what it's like to work with deaf talent. So uh, it's, it's, we really need to have a lot of different topics involved with this discussion. Jevin here. Now, us as a filmmaker myself, I know that when hearing actors, and in, in like, if we find that when there's the voiceover, it doesn't match. I mean, you know, they might, people might think, well, an ADR, or we can do the audio digital recording. Uh, in other words, just have like a voiceover overlay would just be easy to fix. And people think that's just so easy. You just have a voiceover actor there, but you have to take into consideration that there's no voiceover uh, to make sure that the signing is 
authentically represented. Or reshoot it. Right. Or I have to just make sure, you know, if it isn't, then you have to do that reshoot and you have to go back. And of course, all that expense that goes into that. So obviously, yes, it is important to have somebody there to do the entire production from beginning to end. So uh, let me see. Now we have a few minutes left. Uh, I want to see if we're open for any Q and A's. I know people may be wanting to just ask you questions as panelists. So, um, Dal, uh, would you, I guess, go through the questions or let me know what questions our audience members would like to ask? So I would uh, wait. Uh, let's see if I see any questions come up. You can use the raise hand feature. You can also post your questions in the chat if you'd like. This is Doug. I, I wanted to mention uh, to you, Jevin, in terms of saving cost, hiring one or two in pre-production, it, it really makes a lot of things easier in post-production and it does save the company a lot of money. Yes. Well, I have a question if you don't mind. Okay, Tal. So one area that isn't uh, discussed often is the marketing and promote promotions, the PRs, the press, the interviews. Um, do you have any personal experience as a deaf person? Um, how is it that you would give any advice to our hearing audience, you know, to, to in a studio, how to approach the press, the publicity of it? This is Doug speaking. First, make sure that everything is accessible, subtitled, captioned. Some of them I notice that there are no captions and then we have to bug them to say, hey, do you mind adding captions? Uh, sometimes they'll reach out and everything seems to be worked out, but then they forget about the interpreters. And so they have to know uh, to reach out to a deaf person. They can have an interpreter on deck or, or be prepared or the deaf person can provide who they prefer as sign language interpreters. Uh, so they, they, they need to have the resources. Yes. Going here. I like the idea if the studio would come to me and ask me which interpreters I prefer to work with. Yes, I do not want the studio to on their own to go out and find interpreters to bring to the set. I want to have the control and give the studio the names of people that I trust, that know me, that know my technical terms that I use or that are used on the set. So I prefer to have people I know, interpreters that work with me. And then that makes the work so much easier for everyone in the room. This is Del. One thing that I've learned is that when we request an interpreter, make sure that we request an interpreter who is a strong voice or a person who is able to go from sign to English. Sometimes an interpreter may be a good fit, other times may not. So it, interpreting agencies need to know which of their interpreters do have the skill to go from sign to English, what we call voices, whether they're TV or radio. Um, just something I think that's important that you put in your request, strong voicer, because those are the interpreters that, you know, you want to have as the interpreters while they're being interviewed or on camera. Now, let me ask, are there any other questions? This is Jevin. I have a question for James. Um, when you auditioned for Theo, uh, that role of Theo, were you selected as a deaf actor or were you selected and then it was created in that role that the character was deaf? Was that decision prior to you or how, how was that that was navigated? You know, how did that audition? Of course, there's a barrier that could exist. So if you could tell us about that. Joey here, John Hoffman, who created the show, wanted the character of Theo to be deaf. They decided that. So the casting call was sent out looking specifically for a deaf actor. And I'm happy that my team or the 
they they selected the people the casting office did a great job of bringing in uh, deaf actors and I was very happy for that uh, often I have seen roles go to speaking actors hearing actors which is really frustrating when I auditioned uh, and my tape was sent in because I had to do a self tape for the audition. The casting office reached out to me and wanted me to do the callback through Zoom. And they asked me for the name of an interpreter. And I thought that was really nice. So I submitted my preferred list of names because then I didn't have to worry. I mean, in Zoom, I know we're not worrying about meeting uh, somewhere in person. It's from the comfort of your own home. So they found an interpreter for me for my callbacks and they had a reader uh, that they used another actor and I could talk with that person and we could design, you know, decide on our signing and we re redo it. And that's how that procedure went. This is Jevin. So we have one minute left very quickly. Could you please tell us what the next projects you're working on, if you're able to mention them or what are your plans here and after? We'll start with uh, Doug first and then we'll go to Joey. So what's next for you both? What's in the works now? Well, my, my next, okay, what, tell me which one for career-wise or my next project? Your next project, uh, what's next for you? I'm working uh, currently on a Marvel uh, project uh, and that's coming up soon in the very near future. So keep your eyes open for that. Can't wait to see that. And Joey? I know that season two of Only Murders in the Building has been announced, and I am hoping that I will be involved in that. We will have to wait and see if the writers keep Theo in. Yes, please don't die. And there are two more episodes left of Only Murders in the Building. Well, one was released today, so there's oh, only one more after today. That's right. It's Tuesday. One was released today. Yeah, and I do have a project for summer 2022, Joey is saying. I'm going to be working with the Music Man, the musical, and I'm going to be doing the lead role of the Music Man. That's fantastic. This is Dal. Now, one final question. Um, did you find an ASL coach or how is it that you were able to make sure that as an ASL coach, your consultant was brought up, uh, was a qualified person? That's a question that was asked. Anyone can answer? Well, this is Doug. Hey, first look at their IMDb and see their credits and see what movies uh, or, or films they worked on and see if, if what you think about the, the sign language and, and if it qualifies as up to par um, for what you want. But I think some movies uh, don't really have great uh, quality outcomes. And so you kind of have to watch out for that too. Uh, but that's a good start. And, uh, and fortunately, you can ask people in the industry that have worked with those ASL consultants to see if they were a pleasure to work with, easy to work with. Uh, and if they say, oh gosh, you know, this person was terrible, you know, you can kind of narrow it down from there. Joey here, deaf people in the industry already do know who's wonderful to work with and to have on the set as an ASL consultant. So I think you, you get the word out and you ask other deaf actors. I think it's easy to find somebody who's qualified. This is Delbert. Now, all of you, please give the deaf coach or deaf ASL consultant, give them um, curtain uh, in the credits, make sure you mention them, if, you know, as an IMDB uh, is part of their system. So please, we encourage you, deaf people need to make sure that they build themselves and rise in the ranks as well. You know, I'm sure when you were first in that field, you wanted that. So if we could just please help us to build our, our, our web by including their names in the credits. Any last comments, Jevin? This is Jevin. Uh, people want to figure out how it is that you can find those resources for working with uh, people with disabilities. So I'd recommend looking into Respectability's Hollywood's toolkit. Um, it's a resource in different disabilities as a starting point to be able to guide you. Uh, and, and so that's one other option that people can take. This is Dell. 
Great. Well, we'd like to wrap it up. I'd hate to wrap this up. It's been a wonderful conversation. I'm sure we could be going on for weeks and weeks. Maybe we should have, you know, a podcast for that. I don't know. We'll see. We'll have to hear about that. But I'd like to close by just giving you some information uh, that in the month on every Tuesday and Thursday nights in the month of October, we're going to be hosting panels. Uh, from Respectability's website. You'll get a lot of information there about what we plan to talk about. Um, in the chat, you can click there to see all the events that are coming up. That's just coming up on the chat. So we thank you for coming and uh, goodbyes and uh, make sure you have your marshmallows. Goodbye. Bye everyone, goodbye. <laughs>